Well, after Jesus was raised from the dead, he sent his followers out and the church exploded. It went all throughout the Roman Empire and there was only one thing that could have stopped them and it almost happened. Now I want you to look behind me. The, the most passionate person spreading Christianity was a guy that got converted. He, was, uh, he went by the name of Saul. Uh, he was, as we talked about earlier in this series, the Hasidim, the holy ones, the people who are most passionate about the laws and obeying them. He was one of them. And once he got converted by Jesus on the road to Damascus, north of Israel, he became just as passionate about spreading Christianity as he was about persecuting it. In fact, he went on a couple, three missionary journeys. He started here in Antioch, which is a major center, population center, went by sea to modern-day Turkey, which is Asia Minor in that time, and then went all through the mountains here to these important Roman towns, about died in the process, literally about dying almost at every turn. The persecution was so fierce, he went back to Antioch, gathered his senses, got ready, and then went back for a second missionary journey. On the second missionary journey, he decided that he was going to go by land through the mountains, through his hometown in the area of Sarsis, all the way up to here. And when he was in Troas, the end of the Asian world, he got a vision, a vision, a dream of a man in this area saying, I want you to come and share the gospel. And so because of a dream, the Apostle Paul went and started these churches all through here, eventually going into Athens, over here in Ephesus, note that, and then went back home. He was so excited about what happened in every single one of these churches. Clusters of churches all throughout the Roman Empire, just from him and a guy named Barnabas and other co-workers that he brought along with him. But then he got worried about those churches and said, I need to go back to those churches and strengthen them strengthen him. So he went on a third missionary journey where he went up through the mountains again and he just retraced his steps all the way through these churches eventually in this city called Ephesus where he stayed for two years teaching and sending out missionaries all throughout that world. The end result, the map of Christianity at the end of Paul's ministry looked like this. The purple represents the major population centers. Um, over here you have Antioch, a major city. Over here you have Ephesus, a major city. Over here you have Athens and Corinth, major population area, and over here Rome. Christianity had spread throughout the Roman Empire in the matter of 35 years. But then Paul died, and Peter died, and the church continued to grow, but the question became, who was going to lead these people? They really didn't have a Bible to speak of. It wasn't until the late 60s and 70s where we have the Gospel of Matthew that's written, where you have the Gospel of Mark, where you have the Gospel of Luke, and the very thing that could have stopped the movement of Christianity throughout the world almost happened. And it wasn't persecution. Persecution made the church grow faster. It wasn't lack of funds. Lack of funds almost made it easier for the church to spread in a viral fashion. You want to know what almost stopped the church in its tracks? False teaching. People rose up in those churches, and they didn't have a Bible to speak of. It was expensive to copy, and so they had to rely upon word of mouth, especially the word of mouth of people that knew the disciples. Now... All of, the, all of this time, up now into the 80s and into the early 90s of the first century, all of the apostles were dead. Every single one of them. And so when they looked for someone to lead them and to give them authoritative teaching, they had no one to look to except for one person. The Apostle John. The Apostle John lived to the ripe old age of Betty White. He was truly the Betty White of the apostles. In fact, there was a rumor that started, he included, included this in his gospel, called the Gospel of John, 
where there was a rumor that he was never going to die. Look at it. It says, Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. And this was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray, betray you? And when Peter saw him, John, he asked, Lord, what about him? In other words, I kind of got raked over the coals, but you showed me forgiveness and love. What about this guy? Jesus answered, if you want him to remain alive until I, or if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. And because of this, the rumor spread among the believers that this disciple would not die. Well, eventually, John finds his way, church history tells us, to an to the city called Ephesus. Ephesus was a major base of operations in the Roman Empire. It was a major Roman city, but it wasn't Rome. Paul, Peter, church history tells us, were killed in Rome. John camped out around Ephesus in this city in western Turkey. Do you have the map here? This is the place where Paul was almost ripped apart by a crowd in the Colosseum. This was the place where Paul spent two years training people. And so John goes, and he goes to this area, and eventually then, the purple represents now the spread of Christianity. Look how much Christianity spread all throughout the Asian minor area in modern-day Turkey. The problem was, as Christianity spread, so spread false teaching, inaccurate teaching. And so the problem was is that they didn't have a Bible. Not everyone had the scriptures. Some areas had collected the letters of Paul. Some people had a copy maybe of a gospel. But the average person that was in a church community maybe had access to someone that knew a disciple of Jesus. And so John realized there was a problem here. Now, I just want to pause here and show you a video of Chinese Christians. Christians who were following Jesus where it's illegal and they're receiving their very own Bible for the very first time. Take a look. Let that sink in for a moment. Where can we get Bibles? Well, there's a stack of them in there. You can get them on your phone. You can get them at any bookstore. The Gideons threw these Bibles around like popcorn in hotel rooms, thankfully, for people to read them. But imagine being in a place where you didn't have access to a Bible anywhere. And you weren't close to anyone that actually knew Jesus. So you had to hear it second hand, or third hand, or fourth hand. Well, the Apostle John knew that he had to put something in writing. Because as Christianity spread, so spread the error of a lot of bad teaching. And so he wrote a gospel that we call the Gospel of John, and he wrote three letters that are at the end of our New Testament. We call them 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Now let me just pause, and I want to ask you another question. Who is a popular false teacher? Who is someone that is a false teacher in Christianity that you readily can name by name? Lean over to the person next to you and name their name right now. Share their name. How many of you are like, nah, I can't name anybody? Imagine you have the internet, you have television, you have a church where you're not literally beaten going there, you have access to God's word, and but yet we can't really discern who among Christianity is teaching something that's a little bit off. I want you to think about that for a second. Jesus said, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. 30 years later, the Apostle Paul said, for the time will come when people will not put up a sound doctrine and said to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. And that was happening then in John's time in the church, just like it's happening today. In fact, by reading the letters of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, scholars can deduce one thing happened. John, the churches that he was leading, was faithfully teaching. 
But some people didn't like what John was teaching, and so they went out and started another church and another network of churches. And so the Apostle John wrote this letter called 1 John, which is sort of like, you know those emails that your grandmother and your great aunt forward to everybody in the family that's been forwarded like 30 times? That's what the book of 1 John is. It's a letter that's meant to be copied and shared and read in all of the churches. Now, the problem was the people that went out to start these other churches started coming back and soliciting and proselytizing the people in John's churches. So John quickly got those letters out. He wrote 2 John and 3 John to basically counteract their influence. And so the beginning of 1 John begins this way. Look at what he says. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim to you the word of life. In other words, I was there. He was my friend. I ate with him. I touched him. He snored a lot. It was crazy. I, like I lived with him. The life appeared of Jesus. We have seen it and we testify it to, to it, meaning the apostles. We proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has now appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also, and note this word, that you may have fellowship with us. In other words, aberrant churches that were started with false teaching, we proclaim this to you so that you now may have fellowship back with the churches that are teaching the true perspective of Jesus. And our fellowship of this group who are teaching the correct way of Jesus, we have fellowship with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, and I write this to you so that your joy, may, uh, you may make my joy complete by coming back into the fold. Now, in other words, what John is saying is, you heard, these people heard about Christianity from me. Who are these people that you're following who have these weird ideas about who Jesus is and what he's done or what he hasn't done? Why are you listening to them? Why aren't you listening to the guy who actually knows him? Now, he goes on in chapter 2, and he says, Dear children, this is the last hour, and you have heard that the Antichrist is coming. You undoubtedly have heard that word before, Antichrist. We don't know about that. Even now, many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it's the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belong to us. But you, even though you don't have a copy of the scripture, of these New Testament documents, you have an anointing from the Holy One. His spirit is inside of you so that you can discern. That doesn't seem right. That does seem right. You have an anointing from the Holy One and you all know the truth. I do not write to you because you do not know the truth but because you do know it, and because no lie comes from the truth. And so these people went out, and the church exploded right after the resurrection. And then eventually, they started going into error because there was no one there to lead them. John steps into this gap. Now, John does two things. Number one, he teaches the truth. I know the truth, John says. I teach you the truth of what Jesus taught. But second, he does it with love. What we're going to focus on in 1 John in this series is love. Uh, in the gospel, the apostle John says, law was given through Moses. If you break the law, you're going to get zapped. But grace and truth came through Jesus. That's not a bad way of thinking about your whole life. Parenting needs to be about truth. You need to be here on time. You need to do this. You need to clean up your toys. You need to be responsible, but also grace. We're going to create boundaries and truth, but we're going to show grace. And in our relationships, Paul's saying, is that we need to teach the truth, but we need to be as loving and gracious and forgiving as possible. So we're starting a new series today called Can't Buy Me Love, obviously based on the Beatles song. What we're going to do is we're going to go through the letter of 1 John, and we're going to look at the different ways John talks about real love. In our culture, we have a solid word of love. 
that we talk about finding love, being in love, showing love. And the way that we do that is so antithetical to the way God teaches love, being in love, showing love, that it's going to come out in stark contrast as we go through this letter. Now the goal is simple, to know the truth about Jesus, but also to be as loving as possible in our, how we live out that truth. So turn in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. We live in the United States where Bibles are completely and totally available everywhere. Hold up your Bibles, everyone. Look around the room. All right, now you got me. Hold up your phones. Yes, I was just trying to get you. That's on the phone. But I want you to get in the habit. If you are truly someone who reads the Bible on your phone, then you bring your phone here when we gather for worship. But if you're someone that reads a hard copy Bible, I want you to bring a hard copy Bible here so that the Bible that you're studying when we gather together is the Bible that you're reading in home. Okay? Deal? I got two people with a nodding head there. Here we go. Here we go. All right. Now, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 begins this way. It says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, come not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Now, I want you to notice something. He tells us that we shouldn't love the world. But I want you, everyone, right now, I want everyone to recite with me the most famous verse in the entire Bible. John 3, 16. You ready? For God so loved the world. Okay, stop right there. What the heck is going on? So the Gospel of John tells us that God loves the world, but then John tells us not to love the world. Uh, the, the word that's used here for world is used in two different ways. John's gospel uses it referring to people. John's letter of 1 John is talking about things and beliefs and the culture of the world. That we're not to love the beliefs and the things and the culture of the world. Some of us are here today, and we have issues that we're trying to fix in our lives. And it can be directly traced back to the fact that you have become a disciple of Jesus, but you have not broken off your love affair with the world. You're trying to follow Jesus, and you're trying to follow the world at the same time. We are so quick to look at high schoolers that become Christians, and then they fall prey to the peer pressure that is in their high school, I'm telling you firsthand, what, how they react is nothing compared to the average 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 year old person in this room. We're like, you can't do that with your friends. You can't buckle to peer pressure. Really? Look at what, look at what John says. Now, did anyone see the pictures released this week uh, in the Congo of gorillas taking selfies with park rangers. <laughs> in the Virunga National Park, a park ranger was uh, snapping selfies so constantly of him with the gorillas that um, eventually they started standing up. Well, so here's a picture of this, of the park ranger with the gorillas, and eventually he snapped so many of the selfies that look at what the gorillas did. They were like, they did what humans do, right? Isn't that the cutest thing? Now, these are rescues. And so he's constantly snapping selfies of him with the gorillas that he did it so much that they started standing up every time he turned around and pulled his phone out. Now, here's my question. As cute as that is, do gorillas pose for selfies in the wild? Of course not. In the same way, what we do as disciples is that we have an opportunity. What is inside of us, the anointing that John talks about, the spirit of God that lives inside of us, naturally draws us to live as Jesus did. The problem is we're still in this culture. We go to their schools. We live among them in their neighborhoods. 
We are friends with them. We work with them. We are constantly on this. Two to five hours a day, the average person in this room is on this. Compare that to how much you read your Bible. How much time do you spend watching television and going different places? The Apostle Paul is saying, listen, we have to learn what not to love before we can know how to love. And so that's what we're going to focus on today, what not to love. And what we're not to love is the world. And I can see John thinking, you know what, people are like, what the heck does that mean, not to love the world? That is like the most vague concept. So he drills down on three key ideas. He says that loving the world is basically this, loving the lust of the flesh. What does that mean, the lust of the flesh? Undoubtedly, John is talking about wrongful sexual behavior. As disciples of Jesus, we're told not to have premarital sex, sex before marriage. We're told not to have affairs. We're told not to practice homosexuality. But it's way more than that. Sarcos, the lust of our, the body, is way more than just our sexuality. What about food? What about gluttony? When was the last time you were talking to a Christian who was going on and on and on about the evils of homosexuality as they're pounding down a 3,200 calorie cheeseburger? Alcohol, anything that we do with our body, allowing our bodies to com be completely racked with stress without carefully caring for ourselves when it comes to sleep. Anything that has to do with the flesh, John's talking about here. The next thing he says is loving the lust of the eyes. Now we're to avoid lusting after people and lusting after things. When was the last time you drove through your neighborhood and you saw a car that someone in your neighborhood was driving and you lusted after it? Or you drove by their house and you lusted after their house. When was the last time you were here on a Sunday morning and you lusted after all of this? <laughs> You're like, okay? It's hard. It's hard to resist that temptation. I get that. Then the Apostle John says the pride of life. And undoubtedly in some component the Apostle John is referring to the boasting that comes from the wealth that we've been given in the world. The way money has a way to make us prideful. Little things like you're in Wegmans or you're in Giant checking out and you're paying with cash, you're paying with, you have ample money to buy these groceries but there's someone else that's slowing you up in line because they're paying with government assistance and some part of you is looking down on them. Or you do feel boastful about your home because God allowed you to grow up in a family where you were supported and you had the resources and the encouragement to go for advanced training and education. You had the health to be able to stick with it, the stamina to be able to stick with it, and so you've created extra wealth for you. And so now when you're looking at your yard and your house and the things that you have, you drive through your neighborhood and you're looking at another house where a person is not taking care of their house as much as you are, and the yard doesn't look as nice as yours does, and you look at them, you're like, my gosh, we don't live in a trailer park. You're driving down the resale valley of our neighborhood. The clothes that you're wearing right now, the way you look down on people, we just have this tendency to do this. You look down on people that look different from us because they don't have the resources that we have. We talk all the time about our pet sins that are so easy for us to run away from. But all of the sins that the Apostle John are talking about, we all struggle with these. And so John says if we're going to become great at love, we have to know what not to love. Everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life come not from the Father but from the world. Can I share with you a verse from 1 John that is really encouraging and really frightful at the same time? 1 John 2, 6. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. That's pretty clear, isn't it? How did Jesus handle money? How did handle Jesus handle people? How did Jesus handle things? He was tempted by all of them, just like we are. He had the same struggles. 
but he fought against them. In fact, he ran from them. And that's what the Apostle John is saying here. We need to run from these temptations. Now, the other day, I stumbled upon a real video that conveys the urgency of running away from danger. Here is a mountain biker in Alaska. Pay very close attention. Now, fortunately, there was a hunter near that path that fired some warning shots into the dirt. Can you imagine doing that this week? That fear, that healthy fear of running as fast as you can away from something is what John is talking about. I want you to just think about all of the people that we know whose lives have been tripped up because of the lust of the flesh, the lust of their eyes are because of the pride of life. We know what this does. So John says, friends, avoid it. Now, true to the nature of disciples, just like that Beatles song says, disciples of Jesus know that their love, their adherence, their affection cannot be bought by the world. It cannot be owned by the world. It cannot be influenced by the world because we're going to fight against it. And their allegiance is not up for sale. John says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If, the lo if anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life comes not from the Father but from the world. The world and its desires will pass away. But whoever does the will of God lives forever. Let's pray. God, we just pray that sometimes it feels like we're living in the latter part of the first century. We just feel like you're not speaking. You're not there. We wonder where to turn. We are thankful that in Scripture we have the full revelation of truth about Jesus how to know him, how to obey him, and how to help others find him. God, we pray that as we continue to grow as Jesus' disciples, that we would grow not just in understanding the truth, but that, God, you would help us to grow in love. Love for one another, love for the poor, love for those who are being oppressed, and love for people who are doing the oppressing. We pray, God, that through our continued growth, our learning, our yearning, as we become holy, not just in the way we live, but holy yours, God, we pray that as disciples, we would impact the world the way they did in the first century. We pray this in Jesus' name. Thanks for watching today's message. Make sure to check out Brian's new book, Finding Favor, God's Blessings Beyond Health, Wealth, and Happiness. To sign up for Brian's newsletter, please go to Brian's website at brianjones.com.